I am because I belong. What benefits one person should benefit many. What threatens one threatens many. For millions of years, human technology has walked hand in hand with nature, taking and giving in balance until now. A revolution's upon us. It will be the biggest test of our humanity. And we will need to collaborate and to unite to imagine a new world. It is the solutions we find now that will revolutionize the future of our species. A new wave of innovation and inspiration is surging through the blood of our scientists and decision makers. Industrial technologies made it possible to basically do without nature. We, we are facing a very, very serious threat. We are going to sink or swim together. Africa on one hand is a symbol of the problems of the world. On the other hand, Africa holds the intelligence for the solutions. The intelligence is embedded in the zebra. It's in the termite. It's in the kingfisher, it's in the whale. It's in its lichens, it's in its uh, mushrooms. Africa holds such a rich intelligence that we, not only in Africa, but we need in the whole world. It's not that we're gonna run out of the resource. If we need coal, we will find coal. If we need oil, we will find oil. If we need gas, we will find gas. But we're gonna run out of atmosphere. Climate change is around for a few centuries to come. But it is certainly in terms of a big challenge probably the single biggest challenge faced by society across the world at one time. Climate change has an impact on so many people going hungry on a daily basis. It just has to be altered to be able to do it differently. Our modern ways are altering the Earth's climate, so much so that indigenous people deep in Africa are reporting the same changes in nature as leading scientists. In many places, survival is becoming impossible as the lifeblood of water stops falling from the sky. The people who walk the lightest on the earth are suffering the most. The trees tell us the rain is gone. The sap is so little. The rain has been taken away. Even our water root plants are drying up. Everything is dry. The most powerful computers in Africa are tracking the climate changes and telling us the same tragic story. Resident populations in these very arid zones, which to start with are very difficult places to live in, are going to find those small shifts and those temperature increases pushing them beyond a threshold of viability in those locations. And a key indicator is the kookaburm, or the quiver tree, which is dying off in its northern regions, uh, northern South Africa and up into Namibia, because the temperatures are getting too hot for it. And the kookaburm is expanding on the southern limit of the range because it's looking for cooler climates. Africa's western interior is getting drier and hotter, while the east is getting wetter. Desertification, water stress, food shortages and disease threaten the entire continent. Now in Africa, we're very exposed to climate change. The magnitude of the climate change looks to be moderate to large. 
And our capacity to respond in Africa is very small because many of our activities are right to, on the edge of uh, viability. So consequently, we're very vulnerable in Africa. In fact, we could argue that the entire Africa is the most vulnerable continent in the world. Being vulnerable is nothing new to the people of Africa. We've been here before. From the very beginning, the shifting climate has guided the journey of all modern humans. A hundred and ninety-five thousand years ago, the Earth's temperature drops, plummeting into an ice age. Glaciers cover large parts of Africa. The world becomes a dry, frozen wasteland. The Sahara and the southern deserts expand by more than twice their size. The first modern humans have just come into being in Africa. The dryness squeezes human populations into a few habitable pockets across Africa. Our human population plummets to just a few thousand people. One group takes shelter in the protected coastal caves of southern Africa. To survive, they have to learn to collaborate and to evolve as a community. They live off the rich fat from large mammals, nutrient-rich marine life and fleshy underground bulbs, a vital combination unique to this region. In the face of early climate change, the spirit of Ubuntu was born. The African culture of togetherness that would drive our species forward. After 60,000 years, the Ice Age comes to an end. Water returns to Africa and the climate stabilizes. The small, resilient human populations emerge from their safe pockets and quickly spread across the entire planet. From the very beginning, we were hunter-gatherers. We lived in and with nature. We followed the rains and the herds. The skies and the water brought us life. They fed the plants we ate and the animals we hunted. Our survival depended on our understanding of the climate. The skies guided us. The legendary Bushman rainmakers were the climate change scientists of their day. They prepared the land for rain. They knew if they harmed the land, the rain wouldn't come. Their folklore tells of the clouds men and the mist people and the great rainmakers who would dance for the climate. Clues to this legacy remains engraved in the stones. They hunted the rain animals, unlocking the mysteries of the weather gods. Seven thousand years ago, another major shift in climate happened in Africa. The monsoon rains moved, leaving the Sahara drier and drier. The climate priests of Africa built a temple to the skies and learned to read the patterns of the weather. 
This was the world's first observatory that allowed people to map the movements of the sun along the horizon and accurately predict the seasons. They realized that the climate was once again changing and in order to survive, they migrated. Those that didn't heed the messages of the skies, they paid the ultimate price. The survivors went on to change the world forever. Agriculture flourished. For the first time in our history, we attempted to control the natural balance of life. We stopped being nomadic. We planted crops and domesticated animals. The agricultural revolution created surplus, a key ingredient in the explosion of human populations. The old knowledge of the hunter-gatherers was buried away. Technology became the new god. Our communities grew and we were forced to specialize. No longer hunting and gathering for our survival, we became disconnected from nature. We began to master technology and the Industrial Revolution was upon us. What seemed to be the greatest symbol of human collaboration and ingenuity, the city came to be. The discovery of fossil fuels took us on a booming ride of adventure. For the first time in history, more than half the world's population now lives in cities. At, at least since the Industrial Revolution, urban systems and cities, which were identified as the ultimate arrival point of modern civilization, were designed to be completely suspended and above and disconnected from natural systems. The dream of progress came at a price as one species, humankind, began to influence the planet's climate. The future of all life as we know it is taking on a haunting new face as rainfall, temperature, ocean conditions change rapidly. Sea level is something people jump on a lot. They get quite worried about it. And not surprisingly, because much of the world's population lives on coastlines. It's primarily at the moment, a function of thermal expansion. In other words, you warm something up, it takes up more space. So you warm up the oceans, they take up more space. And the only place they can do that is by rising the, raising the sea level. So that's what we're experiencing mostly at the moment. Some of that sea level rise is coming from melting glaciers, and some of it's coming from melting ice caps, but not the major portion at this stage. So the sea level rises, and then there's a second consequence. It's not just what we call the static rise, which uh, encroaches on the coastlines but it also increases the erosion of soft coastlines. So if you're living on a sand coastline, as the sea level rises, it makes the wave erosion of that coastline that much worse. Polar ice caps help to control the major global climate systems that drive our planet. But they are melting faster and faster every year. The melting has dire consequences for Africa. The village of Yugo Piri lies on the edge of the Great Sahara Desert. It's the hottest place in the world. Here in West Africa, the Dogon women climb 3,000 feet each day for one bucket of water. The smallest change in rainfall here could destroy a culture that has endured for thousands of years. We are going to see increasing wars over food and also intense scarcity of water. Half of the world's population go hungry 
and that's going to cause conflicts on a major scale. That will challenge us in terms of being able to keep world peace. And the institutions we have for world peace are already stretched thin and are already quite dated and archaic. The United Nations was created after World War II. For those times and for those conflicts, well, this is a different story. We're not going to stop climate change. The challenge now is can we manage climate change? And so the solution really is controlling uh, the greenhouse gas emissions, controlling the limits to how, how intense they grow in terms of their concentrations. Because if we don't do that, we're going to have a runaway system where we're going to have impacts beyond the, the viability of many sectors of society. Namchua is a remote Bushman village in northern Namibia. The elders here are the last of a generation that grew up as nomadic hunter-gatherers. The small community fights desperately to hold on to their traditional lifestyle. But even here, thousands of kilometers from the nearest city, climate change is taking hold. Life here depends on one thing, rain. They would all dance together and make rain. Little my dead husband and his fathers, they used to know the place of rain. Now only my son is left, our last healer. His soul and the ways of rain are buried too deep. He is sick. He tries, but he cannot see what the ancestors say to him. In the old days, there was more rain. Our ancestors lived well. There is so little rain, so little sap. Even our water root plants are drying up. It is not good anymore to live in the bush. There is not enough felt food. We don't want to stay in the bush anymore. We must now leave the bush and move to the cities. We must learn the Western ways. At least we will have clothes and food. Africa has been responsible for about 1% of the emissions. It's, it's clearly unfair that uh, the ones who have been least responsible for this huge threat that is facing us should be the ones who have to pay uh, the most our urban sprawls have fragmented the natural systems of this earth. Our ever-growing populations crowd the streets and the highways in pursuit of progress. Our cities consume 75% of the world's energy, and they're responsible for more than half the planet's emissions. Trapped in these giant concrete mazes, it seems impossible to imagine another way. But it is the ingenuities of those that plan and construct the heroes of our industrial age that may ironically have the answers. We cannot all go back and be subsistence farmers or hunter-gatherers. I mean, that's also not possible. If you bring the challenges to the scientists and the engineers and you ask them, solve this problem for us, they will solve it. So if we bring the, the question of how can we use the sun, people will solve it. And they will solve it and they will come up with reliable machines that will generate electricity from the sun year in, year out for 20, 30 years down the line. It's possible to solve these issues. We must just do it. Universities across the world are creating entire units dedicated to understanding climate change and solving the huge challenges we all face. It seems to be a race against time as we move closer and closer to a, to a point of no return. A team at the Center for Sustainable Energy at Stellenbosch in South Africa has been exploring large-scale energy solutions powered entirely by the sun. In, in, in the South African environment, we really are not making use of solar energy. 
and we have an abundance of solar energy. We have an area in the Northern Cape which is the best so spot for solar energy in the world. An area of just a few thousand square kilometers of African desert could produce the solar energy equivalent to the entire oil production of the Middle East. African scientists and their global partners have a dream of covering the desert floors with giant glass greenhouses. The air beneath the glass sheets is quickly heated by the sun's energy. Convection pushes air to the center of the structure, which then naturally escapes through a huge chimney. The fast-moving air drives massive turbines which produce large quantities of electricity. Now, 10 of these tunnels would power an entire modern city. The chimney stretches a kilometer into the air and the glass covers an area of 38 square kilometers. Initially, electricity from solar chimneys may cost more than coal energy, but over time, this will change as the power plants literally run themselves. I'm convinced that once we start building large solar um, power stations in South Africa and they work, people will catch on to that and we will be able to then motivate to build more of them and then displace the coal. At the moment, because we have the energy crisis, people are going for the lowest risk technical risk in, the, in, in this case, where if we build another coal-fired power station, we know we have coal, we know how it works, we will build it and it will work. However, if we want to build a solar chimney or we want to build an, a large central receiver plant, there is still some technical risk and some financial risk involved, and people don't want to step forward and do it. The university has a large slate of viable renewable projects waiting to happen. Government support is critical as we fast run out of time to transfer to clean energy. Who will pay in the end for the nuclear waste? Who will pay in the end for the big holes in the ground where we've dug all the coal out? It's not we that pay with it, people that live right now. It's our children and our children's children. And in the case of nuclear energy, our children's 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 children who will have to worry about that. When you look 50 years into the future, we're pretty much locked in as to what's going to happen. Any changes we make now in terms of our efficiency, our energy usage, that's going to change the scenario in the far future, the multi-generational time frames. We're locked into for our generation. And maybe because we are humans, we're a little bit short-sighted and we live for the moment and we say, but we want access to cheap energy. We don't want to pay more for our energy. And that's why we're in the situation that we're in. However, if you go and you see what's happening in Cape Town at the moment where they are selling green energy, Initially, they thought they will have to go to a few large corporate clients to flog their energy. The way it turns out now, it's a bunch of private households who are coming forward and say, we will pay more as long as we can buy some of this green energy. So our challenge is really to become more, more efficient. We need energy. We can't just suddenly stop using energy. So we need energy, but we need to be more efficient in how we use it, and we need to transition to renewable energies or alternative energy sources. That takes time. So we need to move fast. The longer we delay in starting that process, the bigger the impact is going to be down the road. There is more energy available from the wind than our entire current global energy consumption. Of all clean energy, it's the most cost-effective. For thousands of years, mariners have harnessed the wind to cross the oceans, so it's an obvious jump to imagine the future of shipping. Fitting these ships with huge kite systems can cut the fuel costs and emissions by half under optimal wind conditions. The world's first sky sails cargo ship completed its maiden voyage across the Atlantic in 2008, saving thousands of dollars in fuel every day.
We're travelers by nature. Our species has invented more and more advanced ways of getting from A to B. But our need for speed and the addiction to globe trotting comes at a price. Modern forms of transport account for at least 10% of global emissions. Now, electric cars have been around for a very long time, but they were either not much more than fancy golf carts or million dollar sports models. But now Africa is producing the first electric car for the middle class masses. It costs around $20,000 and can achieve 400 kilometers on a single charge. It's fast, reliable, and incredibly cheap to run. Potentially, it could dramatically reduce pollution. It will change the face of cities. It will clean them up, not only visually, but also from a, from a sound point of view. And the idea of sitting at a coffee shop and cars going past and they're making no pollution and you can't hear them is quite, uh, it's quite an exciting idea. It's quite a, quite a neat idea. Underlying all of this, we're really serious about the fact that this is green and this is zero emissions. And we really think it's, it's one of the vital pieces of the puzzle to a sustainable future. Big solutions like these are only part of the picture. In many ways, climate change is a symptom of our disconnection from the natural world. The worldview of those we have tended to dismiss superiorly as uh, uh, primitives is, 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 is becoming clearly more and more something that is, is so pertinent for our time. We should really try to learn and observe from the Bushmen how they succeeded in surviving without water, how they succeeded in having a community where everything from the antelope was being used, where nothing of the kudu was being wasted, and everything had a value for them. In our society, we just have this core business principle. We should focus on only one thing, and when you're studying in university, you should only learn one thing. You should specialize and specialize. You learn so much about one thing that you know everything about nothing. For most of our time on Earth as humans, our ancestors lived in balance. Their society was driven by an understanding of themselves as part of the greater natural system. In hunting and gathering communities, each person's survival depends not on their personal wealth, but on the bonds that they have with their group and the well-being of nature. This sense of altruism is what helped them to survive for almost 200,000 years. This way of being has all but vanished but is being revisited as part of the new urban dream, the modern eco-village. In South Africa, a group of people from all walks of life are looking to nature and indigenous wisdom to find a responsible way of living. The village of houses is built around a children's school, an academy for university level learning, and an organic farm. Poor people who've moved into this community have actually increased their levels of consumption. But unlike if they moved into another development, they're increasing their, their consumption of energy, but not all that energy is electricity. So it's, it's solar and other forms of energy. And, and this is a difficult concept, for partic partic particularly people in the north, who equate sustainability with consumption reduction. In this village, the very young are taught how nature works how to grow food, how to harvest their own supplies. They're taught how fragile the earth is and how we evolved so close to nature. We complain children don't know how to play anymore. And it's because they get connected to nature. And uh, all they have is TV, TV games, and everything else that removes them from away. And so by connecting with nature, the children learn a lot more, that there's a lot more that is bigger than who we are, in just seeing what is happening around them and taking care of the environment. This way of teaching 
is inspired by the hunter-gatherer community, where a child learns and grows with nature. The smell of fire, the feeling of earth on the bare feet, the sounds of a wilderness community, being with the women in search for food. These are the building blocks that lead to a deep sense of the natural environment, to the nature of life. This is how it was for millennia, and so every child ever born expects these things, yet few receive them. I don't think we can go back to those times, though, and I don't think we should romanticize it either. I think it was quite hard, very difficult life, and it wasn't always very nice either. And so, but the good I would take from there is to, we need to find our balance again. And there are lessons there about how you live in harmony, um, with nature where the concept is that you are part of nature. The need for energy is central to human survival and a deeper understanding of nature can unlock fascinating ways of looking at energy creation. So what we're going to do is we're going to show how actually your body makes electricity. The children here are mimicking natural systems and exploring how to use the calcium of eggshells, the potassium of banana peels and the acids of lemon juice to create electricity. When children understand that our own bodies can generate electricity through chemistry, they may be inspired to design the planet's energy needs of the future. The residents here see their village as a natural living system. They see human waste as a resource, and they've employed an unusual workforce to manage the waste. Millions of tiny worms housed in these tanks as ultra-efficient waste cleaners. The waste is food for the worm, and in turn, they create fertilizer, clean water, and methane gas for energy. We didn't manufacture them, we didn't patent them, we didn't, they, they're just a product, they're a three billion year old technology. Learning takes place in an environment designed alongside nature. The buildings here heat, cool themselves. Wind is fed through ducts in the roof and used for cooling. The sun's natural heat is fed through steel pipes to rock stores for heating, and no aircon is necessary. You're basically seeing the building as a living system, not disconnected from the environment. So aircon is basically a statement of disconnection. Renewable energy is best done on a micro basis, what they call micro power generation. 3,000 homes using these tiles will generate the same amount of energy as one giant coal-fired power station. If you have 360 of these, it's equivalent to five kilowatts. And a five kilowatt system is more than you need for powering a middle-class house. The Eco Village runs an inventive business degree that attracts professionals from across the continent. The students here come from Zimbabwe, they come from Namibia, they come from Lesotho, they come from all over. So I think the impact, the potential impact that this can have regionally is actually very big. Way out of proportion of the size, the physical size of this place. So I, I think it's a place that assists you to reconnect to a life that you are familiar with. The low-cost homes here are larger than traditional government buildings. But they cost a fraction of the price to build, yet they're ecologically sensitive and attractive. We are all one and together as a community here. It's a miracle what's happened here. I live like a princess. <laughs> what we try to show here is that you can, that beauty works at different levels, that you can be in a beautiful space, and at the same time, you're living appropriately. You're not living in terms of massive greed. And it's not the poor that waste. It's the middle class. 
It's us that have to learn to pull in our belts, to live in appropriate ways. But at the same time, it doesn't mean going to live like a hippie. As global warming, as uh, the disintegration of ecosystems, as poverty and destruction of humanity deepens, the solutions to that is resilience. It's building the capacity for groups and communities in working in solidarity, in cooperation, in community with each other to say, how do we get greater and greater control of our food supplies? How do we keep the nutrients in our sewage flows? How do we harness our local wind and solar resources? How do we depend more on each other, no matter how rich or how poor we are? How do we grow young people so that they don't think that somehow out there in the big modern industrial system, uh, which is highly unsustainable, somehow that is where their futures lie. One man who offers young people a very different future is Gunter Pauli. He is one of seven advisors to Al Gore and an expert on sustainable design and technology. He sees the future through the lens of nature. Gunter's a pioneer in the field of biomimicry, design inspired by natural systems. Working with hundreds of scientists worldwide, Gunter uses the wonders of Africa as his drawing board. He studies the embedded genius in all forms of life, and he's using this ancient natural technology to redefine the future of the industrial age. Whenever we construct, we have today angles of 90 degrees in our minds, whereas everything around us is based on nonlinear mathematics. I mean, we are so square into the beautiful chaos of natural design. I mean, we're sitting in there with our most incredible, unartificial, unlife sustaining. We cannot sustain life when the only form we can think of is a straight line, and the only angle we can imagine is an angle of 90 degrees. When the only mathematics we have is linear mathematics, whereas in order to build something like this, I can imagine just very simply any type of building having the same type of cover as a leaf has, which basically is a dye. We should dye all the buildings uh, so that every single building can generate its own electricity, just like this leaf does its own energy, its own source of life. What Gunther speaks of sounds like science fiction, but it already exists. Gunther's scientists have created dye-sensitized solar cells inspired by photosynthesis in leaves. These cells could cover our city buildings to generate clean electricity from the sun. Gunther envisions the cities of the future as living, breathing organisms with buildings that generate their own electricity and harvest rainwater, rooftop farms that produce food crops and vegetation to sequester carbon. He sees buildings working like trees, cities like forests. In a building like here, you'll have a waste manager who will take all the paper waste and all the food waste and all the waste biologically created by going to the toilet. All of that is taken out of the building. It's not generating anything. In a forest, whatever is waste for one generates food for the other. In a forest, the leaves that are dropped every cycle of the year in the fall will be generating new nutrients for others. The same tree will offer nectar to the bees and will offer sugar to, through its fruits to the birds. We have this mindset of separating a city into quarters where there is commercial, where there is living area, and where there are offices. That is not the way natural systems work. Everything is mixed together. Everything is continuously feeding off each other and giving life to each other.
At the heart of Gunther's work is the concept of the five kingdoms of nature, the animal, plant, algae, fungi, and bacteria kingdoms that make up all the life on this planet. He's dedicated his life to understanding the way they interact and applying this knowledge to our modern challenges. One of Gunther's great inspirations is the tiny termite. Gunther sees how the termites regulate temperature in their mounds, and he designs skyscrapers that self-regulate temperature through using this natural technology, saving millions of dollars a year on heating and cooling bills. Gunther believes that by mimicking these simple processes, we can revolutionize our futures. Our industry, our modern society, takes in 100% of raw materials, and only 10% is actually consumed. 90% is waste. In natural systems, thanks to the bacteria, the algae, the fungi, the plants and animals, all of these five kingdoms working together, whatever is waste or a leftover for one becomes a nutrient or energy for the other. Everything operates in ambient temperature, in ambient pressure. That means no energy needs to be added like we do with our heat, beat and treat. We think this is a dream? Absolutely not. This is the way the Bushmen has been living. This is the way the ancient cultures of Africa have been living. This is the way how the large majority of grand cultures of the world have been living. They all were zero emission societies and they all observed how the natural system around them was functioning. And thanks to that intelligence they borrowed, they had a wisdom that allowed them to look at the stars and know when to plant that allow them to look at the animals and know when to hunt, that allow them to look at the trees and know when to harvest the berries. The intelligence that is embedded in those systems is the intelligence that our ancestors knew so well how to put to use. And we have totally disconnected ourselves from it. And as a result, we don't see the embedded intelligence. If we learn to mimic the million-year-old secrets that lie behind the spots, the stripes, the patterns on animals' bodies, the tusks, the skin and the horns, then perhaps we can design a more sustainable future. This is the art of biomimicry. Biomimicry is a way of life. Biomimicry is a humble attitude whereby we recognize that we are the recent arrivals on Earth and that these species have resolved so many of the issues that we haven't resolved yet. That these species don't create the collateral damage, they don't have the side effects, the negative effects that we create. So biomimicry is really a way of just simply looking, observing, admiring, being inspired and imagine how we can do better than we're doing today. This new wave of design is seeding itself around the world, drawing inspiration from every part of nature. The hypnotic movement of kelp forests is inspiring technologies to convert ocean energy into electricity. The small, resilient biowave ingeniously protects itself from strong conditions by simply lying flat on the ocean bed, just like its sister, kelp.
the latest fans for computers that are being made today will use the Fibonacci code, the logic of the Kudu's horn, in order to pull out with 30% less energy. Now, if you have less energy used, then you will have less noise. What's one of the things that bothers us with a computer? It makes noise. The fan makes the noise. Now, the noise of the fan means turbulence and friction. It means the bad design. You never hear any bad noise when you're using the mathematics of the Nautilus shell. The simple magic of spiral movement is inspiring the energy efficient design of anything from fans to propellers to water and wind systems that we use in our everyday lives. The secrets of reptiles and creatures that move through sand or water with less friction than polished steel are yet another source of design insight. Their keratin skins are covered with microscopic spikes which reduce friction as they slither or swim. My enthusiasm for Africa starts when I can ask the question, why does the zebra have black and white stripes? The zebra indicates to you how the laws of physics can be used, because when it's black, it gets hot. When it's white, it reflects the heat. And when on one side it's hot and the other side it's cooler, then you have different pressures of air and then you have a wind. And if you have a wind on the surface, then you will take the heat away. We are only thinking that you need to have the white to reflect the heat. No, you need black and white to do it. So let's paint our buildings black and white, the way the zebra decided to paint itself. The genius of sharkskin technology is being applied to ships to reduce the drag from barnacle buildup and save billions of dollars of fuel per year. There is so much wisdom, knowledge, science around us today, but we tend to look always for more of that human-driven and invented science. And it's hard for us to accept that even our space technology and even our modern energy systems and even our food supply systems are quite primitive compared to the way, for example, the whale has taken care of it. A whale produces 6 to 12 volts of electricity to pump 1,000 liters through its 175 million kilometers of veins and arteries. I mean, how does a pump that we have in our industrial system compare to the pump of the whale? So when you look at a whale, you're seeing a system that is perfectly capable of moving liquids around without friction. Now, that's the genius that you see before you. When you look at the whale, how it can move all of those liquids inside its body, you are about to redesign industrial processes. We're recent arrivals. We're, we're just started to learn how to live on this earth. But my God, we better learn it quickly, otherwise there's no Earth left. We're in this problem because of the choices we made. The only way we're going to get out of this problem is by the choices we make. When you hurt any part of nature, treat any part of nature as if it were just a thing, uh, it, it recoils on, on us. Our changes in lifestyle now are not going to affect the next 30, 40 years. That doesn't mean we mustn't do it. This is an issue of what we call generational equity. Are we going to do something now for the benefit of our grandchildren? When we walk, we walk reverently, gently, caringly.
When our species first realized that seeds made plants, made trees, and they decided to mimic this process, we began something that would change our world forever. The agricultural revolution. Now, we stand at a crossroad on our human journey. The time has come for a different revolution, an ecological revolution. I mean, this is the moment in our story when we decide to look to the secrets of the natural world, to the ancient knowledge of those that came before, to design a way forward in balance, a future that celebrates nature, that celebrates life. Thank <laughs> you.